Some of the pretty common questions that I get here on the channel are about arrow setups. What am I shooting? Why am I shooting it? What kind of broadheads? Component system, same thing with Sam. What is she shooting? There's a lot of people with lower energy setups and they're looking for a frame of reference. So in today's video, we're gonna go over that. We're gonna go over what we're shooting and then also the philosophy of why we are shooting what we did and if we're happy with it or if we plan on making any changes to what we're shooting for this coming year. For starters, let's dig into the what and then we'll do the why. So here's my setup, right at about 510 grains and around 17% front of center or so. Victory RIP TKO 250 spine. I got the .006. Uh, the shaft is a little bit less expensive, although when I go over the pricing breakdown, you'll see that actually there's not that much of a difference if I would have gone with the Elites. On the front end, I have the iron well system, which includes the broadhead, the impact collar, and the hidden insert. I've shot both the S125 and the wide 125, and this actually I had pre-ordered the wide solid blades to be able to plug into my older ferrule so I can shoot these this year. And then for that insert system, right now there's 75 grains on the hidden insert from Ironwell and then the impact collar is 10 grains. So total weight up front was 210 grains and I'll have the opportunity either this year to stick with that or jump up by an extra 25 grains if I decide to stay with the same inserts. On the back end, I have the fobs and the fire knock system. And the reason I have this system the way that I do, I use the 1764 it's reamer to drill out the inside of the fob so that I can slide it over the outside of this arrow shaft, which is about 268 OD. So it actually makes an interference fit and I don't need to glue it. The friction holds it in place. And the fire knock on this 204 system is low profile enough that the fob actually slides right onto the shaft and then slides right off over the top of it so that when I have a pass through, the lighter knock actually stays with the arrow. Now on to Sam's arrow. This is a Victory Vap arrow and she has the Valkyrie system. So it's a 200 grain Jagger broadhead, 22 grain sleeve. And then on the back end, she also has the fob and a clean shot lighted knock. Now, in comparison to mine, she just uses the fobs like normal which is to have the little flange in the back and the lighted knock basically holds it in place on the arrow shaft. So when she gets a pass through, the whole thing pops off and we just have to hope that her arrow is nice and stuck into the dirt and easy to find. The reason that we can't do it the same way that I did on my arrow is because her arrows are just too small in diameter. Uh, if I drilled these out, I would need to build it up with quite a bit of a, a wrap in order to make that have a nice interference fit. And because we have the setup like this, if she were to use a shorter lighted knock, she would get facial contact. So we want that little bit longer knock to make that uh, fob a little bit further in front of her face so she doesn't get that contact. And really, this was the first thing that we had tried for her over the summer. We did a lot of shooting and we were planning on trying some other configurations out. But really, she ended up shooting this well enough and was able to build up some confidence that we just didn't feel the need to. So again, she might experiment with other vein configurations this summer just to see if there's anything that she likes more. But this certainly worked out pretty well. Total weight on Sam's arrow is about 430 grains and front of center is just under 22%. That's with, you know, a pretty heavy back end. I haven't chronoed Sam's arrow, but I bet she's probably around 200 feet a second with that 430 grain arrow. And then for my setup, I was right around 270, 272, somewhere right in there. So now let's jump into the why quick. When I look at arrow setups, there's really five categories I tend to compare with. The relative weight or relative importance of those categories might shift a little bit depending on the person and what their goals are. So one category would be penetration. We have the 12 factors that Ashby put together. There's some modern materials and things that he wasn't able to test at the time, but I think a lot of them are Pretty common sense, like aero flight, pretty hard to argue with that one. Structural integrity, again, pretty hard to argue with that one. From a structural integrity standpoint, I'm very happy with both of these systems. I feel like both of them are very optimized for the size of arrows that they're being combined with. For example, on my wife's setup, the Valkyrie system is designed to work with 0.166 inside diameter shafts. Their center pin system that's one piece connected with the broadhead mates really nicely with the inside diameter of that arrow and really the sleeve only sticks out a tiny little bit past the carbon just enough to be able to give you the threading to be able to hold it in place but that long center pin mating inside that shaft gives you good protection against leverage because you have a little bit longer head here it's a little bit more leverage on side loads that it needs to be able to protect against the collar helps with that as well 
and that system also really makes it very easy to get great concentricity and low run out with your broadhead, which is important obviously with a really long head like that. We did some testing on deer carcasses last year where we just tried to see how easy it was to push our arrow setups through and we had a, a few guys around and we got just a couple different broadheads that everybody had and wanted to try. And what we found was that this Valkyrie Jagger broadhead, I could take the arrow, which does not have a whole lot of purchase here because it's a small diameter. I could take that arrow between my thumb and first finger and I could put that arrow between the ribs and push it right into the chest cavity. The mechanical advantage on this head is really good. Couple that with the good edge retention, sharp blade. I got these things polished like a mirror finish. Even though you might say this arrow is not very heavy at 430 grains in comparison to what some of the numbers guys are throwing out nowadays, you know, she's already shooting fairly slow with her lower energy setup. So this was kind of a balance and a trade off between getting something that's heavy, has good front weight, but still allows her to shoot nice and accurately and have some level of range estimation forgiveness in that most likely zero to 20 yard shot distance range. And then we got the iron well heads and component system, high grade materials once again, A2 tool steel on the blade. I believe the ferrules are 17.4. Some of them are titanium. I think these actually might be titanium because they're the 125 grain ferrules. Let's be honest, the hidden insert system gets a lot of flack for not being a very durable system. And I think that's a little bit unfair. If you look at how the broadhead interfaces with the actual shaft, this diameter right here on the broadhead is almost a perfect fit for the inside diameter of the shaft. And you can take a broadhead and a 204 diameter arrow and you can go ahead and push it right in with no insert at all, put it on a table, spin it, and it'll spin like a top. Where the damage can come in is if you just have that hidden insert in the broadhead and you get some side load, then it can blow out the side of the shaft if the carbon is unsupported, or sometimes you'll see a shaft that kind of mushrooms back. But if you're using, number one, a good adhesive to be able to glue that insert and prevent it from being able to slide back in the shaft, and number two, if you're using some kind of a collar, that helps protect that otherwise unsupported carbon, and then I really just, I've never had issues with a reinforced hit system. And that even includes when I tried it on the grizzly stick shafts that I had where I used the Easton hit inserts and then I just took an aluminum arrow that was the right size and used that as my collar. I didn't have any durability issues with that. Anytime I could get that system to break, it would always break like halfway or three quarters of the way up the shaft on a really hard impact, not at the front end. But what I like about this system, what I like about the Valkyrie system is that concentricity tends to be pretty good and unlike some of the half out systems, even if they have collars, I've had some of those after you know hard hits or if you hit something goofy in a target, you might pull that thing out of the target and the broadhead is all of a sudden a little bit wobbly. And it just doesn't seem to happen that much with these systems that really integrate well between the size of the broadhead and the size of the arrow shaft. One thing I wish I would have done differently with the iron wheel system as I epoxied all my inserts in place. I wish I would have just screwed the broadhead onto the insert and just hot melted the whole thing in for two reasons. Number one, if I did want to be able to change out the inserts to get a different weight, then I more easily would be able to do that. And the other thing is, let's say I have a Robin Hood or somebody else, you know, hits the back end of my arrow and splinters the carbon we're shooting, you know, field or something with field points. If I have those inserts epoxied in, then that arrow is pretty much trash. I can salvage the impact collar, but the hidden insert, I can't really get that back. Whereas if I would use hot melt, then if I did have the back end of the arrow destroyed, I could still salvage that entire component system. They do also have a 166 system out now that's a glue-in system, where it's kind of like the Valkyrie in that that post is mated to go inside a 166 diameter shaft. Uh, but you also have the ability to screw in some of their deep six inserts in the back. And it's a glue-in system versus a screw-in system. The one thing you really got to make sure with the Valkyrie system is that you do a really good job of gluing these collars. Because otherwise, if you don't, there's not very much glue surface there. So you can pretty easily have this thing pull out if you did a bad glue job. But as long as that thing's epoxied on there well, I haven't had any issues. And really, when it comes to the things that are most hotly debated, it usually is FOC and arrow mass. And arrow mass is fairly far down the list, but it also impacts another category, another two categories that I deem important when trying to pick a total arrow setup. One of them is trajectory, the other one's noise. Generally a heavier arrow 
is going to be a little bit quieter in flight. It's also going to allow your bow to be a little bit quieter because oftentimes you're going to get a better efficiency number shooting a little bit heavier arrow. But that weight is also going to negatively impact your trajectory. For us hunting whitetails, it's pretty rare to get a shot over 30 yards and it's very common that we could get a 15 or a 20 yard shot, sometimes even closer than that. I've seen some scenarios where deer just about hit the ground by the time the arrow gets there at like a 30 yard shot and there's been other occasions where a deer hardly even moves. It's just really tough to gauge what's going to happen but I think it's pretty hard to argue that apples to apples a quieter setup is generally going to be better in terms of hopefully not having as extreme of a string jumping reaction but it's also I think pretty hard to argue that if a deer does decide to jump the string then a little bit faster setup is going to give you a little bit margin for error in that scenario. Everybody tries to put it on one side or the other, this way is better or this way is better, but I really think that in the real world it's not that cut and dry. It's really situation dependent. Other things that impact noise would be broadhead profile. If a broadhead's got vents it's generally going to be a little bit louder. Fletching also matters. Some of the quietest veins are the low profile veins, something like the heat vein. One of the reasons I tried those out quite a bit last year was because they were very quiet in flight. But forgiveness wise with the bigger broadheads, for me and my setup, they were accurate when I was on, but they were a little bit less forgiving for me when I wasn't quite perfect. Fletching configurations that tend to be the noisiest would be things like feathers or really high profile veins. And when we talk about broadhead profile and fletching profiles, then not only is noise a discussion, but also forgiveness. And that's one of those categories that I think it's really hard to just judge on paper how forgiving a particular setup is gonna be. We have the bow side of things where we can try and make the bow as forgiving as possible, uh, but the arrow plays a large role in that too. If your arrow is not dynamically spine matched to your setup, then it's gonna be really tough to get a forgiving flying arrow. Generally, bigger heads are gonna be less forgiving than smaller heads. If you have a fletching configuration that's got less surface area, smaller profile, and you're trying to steer a big broadhead with it, in general that's going to be a little bit less forgiving. Front of center plays a role too. The higher front of center is, then generally the less fletching profile you can get away with. It's a very dynamic thing and it's, it's something that you just have to test out on the range and see what works for you. And for me that's where I really like to in the summer do a lot of testing where I just write down notes, I shoot groups of various configurations, different broadhead styles, different vein configurations, and I take notes on the group size. The reason that I stuck with the fobs instead of some of the other vein configurations I was trying over the summer for my hunting arrows is that I had done some testing over the summer with the wide heads and I basically just did a forgiveness test. I would take my bow at 30 yards and I would shoot a group and I would torque my bow one way, shoot a group, torque my bow the other way, shoot a group. And I did that with a couple different arrow setups, various vein configurations. Uh, I used four fletch with like the heat veins, I used some of the zinger profiles, I used the fobs, uh, some of the blazer veins, and ultimately when I measured all those groups and kind of the gaps between the groups, the setup with the fobs had the least amount of deviation. And it just seemed like in general, shooting that setup, you know, over hundreds of shots, I just very rarely had any one of those real errant flyer type of shots, whereas with some of the other vein configurations, I might have a little bit more of a spread, uh, especially like the heat veins, they had the largest spread with this particular setup. Even though when I was shooting well, the shots would go right where I would want them. Occasionally I'd have a shot that just didn't quite look right or the tail would whip a little bit. And I didn't really have that at all with this system. So I didn't really do a whole lot of testing with high profile veins. So that might be something I experiment a little bit more with this year as well. Uh, but overall, I've been pretty happy with the performance here. So we talked about penetration, we talked about forgiveness, trajectory, noise, and how those could vary or shift in importance based on the individual setup. For instance, my arrow inherently is going to have a lot more penetration potential than Sam's arrow would be because the bow that I'm shooting out of has probably over doubled the stored energy that I'm able to put into the arrow, which is going to translate to a lot more kinetic energy, a lot more momentum. My wife, she's got a big advantage in me over noise. Her bow is very quiet. It's shooting a lot slower than mine, but I have the big trajectory advantage. It's also important to look at the game that you're hunting and what your normal shot distances are. 
if you're trying to mimic somebody who's a really proficient Western hunter who routinely takes maybe 60, 80 yard shots and their arrow setup is chosen accordingly, it might not necessarily be the best setup for you to mimic if you're hunting whitetails always inside of 20 yards and vice versa the other way around. So the last category that we got to talk about is price. And neither one of these two setups is inexpensive. They're both pretty spendy. Now the expensive portions of these being generally the broadheads and the component systems for both of these companies here, we got lifetime warranties. If there is any kind of damage, that's not that huge of a deal. The bigger thing comes into play when you lose an arrow. Like let's say for instance, last year that doe that I shot, it was that spongy wet moss and the arrow zipped through the deer and just kept going and penetrated past the knock. Kind of a oddball type of scenario, but it happened. That was basically a $75 setup that I lost. I wasn't able to get back because it just penetrated too far in that scenario. Spot and stalks type of hunt and you know, tall grass, plains, Kansas, Nebraska, something like that. It could be very hard to recover that arrow after the fact. We've got the lighted knocks. I think that makes a huge help for sure. But if you lose the arrow, that's your, I mean, that's a big hit in terms of how much you're spending here. I mentioned this was a $75 setup. If I had been using a .001 instead of a .006, it would have been a $79 instead of 75. You know, there's a lot of discussion about does it make it worth it to get the extra straightness tolerance and maybe the assumed better spine tolerance from a higher costing arrow and that most shooters probably can't tell the difference. There's also, I think, the side of it that once you build up an expensive high dollar system like this, it ends up being kind of a, a pretty minuscule difference one compared to the other. We're seeing definitely the biggest price differences for the most part is up here in the, the broadhead component system and also in the lighted knock system if you're a lighted knock person. Obviously, if you're a standard knock shooter, you don't use the lighted knocks and just use whatever came with your arrow shaft, then that's gonna be a pretty substantial savings right there. I'm at a place in my life where even if I understand that a little bit lesser price system can do the job generally just fine most of the time, I'm totally fine with paying a little bit more to get something that I have a little bit more confidence in and I feel like maybe it's a little bit more optimized. But if I were to try and put together, you know, more budget friendly versions of what we got here, then, you know, maybe perhaps instead of an iron well, maybe I'd be going with, you know, like a Magnus head, which also has a lifetime warranty. Maybe instead of the iron well hit, I'd go with a brass hit, use, you know, an Easton aluminum arrow that's appropriately sized as a collar, use something like a nocturnal or something to that effect. Some of the systems like day six ethics offer a really, really good compromise. I've used both of those systems in the past and really haven't had any complaints. Like I mentioned, the only minor complaints that I've ever had is if I do hit something hard, sometimes I'll get a little bit of a wobble where there wasn't one there before. And if that happens, I can either, you know, try and bend it back or, you know, try and rotate the collar a little bit, retighten everything down, or maybe worse comes to worse, just remove that whole system and pop in a new one. But in terms of catastrophic damage during like a actual hunting shot, I don't have any concerns about that with some of those systems and you can get them a little bit less expensive than what we have here. So I hope this was informative, I hope it helped answer a lot of the questions that we get fairly frequently about what we shoot and why we shoot it and if we're planning on changing anything this year. So if you have any additional questions please drop them in the comment section down below and thanks for watching.